today's session, we will talk about the external environment of a company. The external environment of a company is one of the very important input factors and understanding the external environment is very important before we even start the strategic management process. So in today's session, we will talk about what are those elements of the external environment. We will talk about methods, ways of analyzing the external environment. And I will give you a couple of frameworks and tools that you can use as part of the strategic management process when analyzing the external environment. Before we go into the theory, I would like to show you a very practical example of where the external environment played a fundamental role in a strategic outcome of companies in a certain industry. And for this, I would like to take you back to the year 2010, when the Deepwater Horizon um, BP's platform in the Gulf of Mexico had a major accident, a major explosion, and um, caused a major oil spill into the Gulf. So what happened back then was that the company BP was being sued for damages that happened to the people that lived in the area. And as a consequence, as you can see here, the share price dropped dramatically. It basically made BP lose half of its market value at that time. Now that that would happen to BP, you could say that's not really the external environment because arguably, yes or no, BP could have prevented the accident. Um, there was a, a big argument after the fact who was actually to blame, whether it was one of the contractors or whether it was BP themselves. Um, but what is really interesting about this case is that the drop of BP's share price and um, the accident itself not only hurt BP, but it also hurt Shell and Chevron and other competitors who had actually nothing to do with this accident itself. So you can see here that um, the share price of Shell and Chevron also dropped at the same time by 20% or 15% respectively. So in the oil and gas industry, in this specific case, the external environment, like something that happened to another company in the industry, had a fundamental impact on the competitors on other companies in the industry. Um, what is also interesting about the oil and gas industry is that generally the share prices of oil companies and of course also with the share price, the financial performance of um, oil and gas companies correlate with the oil price. Uh, so the oil price is something that the companies cannot control and therefore they have very heavy influence of the external environment of the oil price um, on their financials and eventually also on their strategy. So let's go into what are the elements of the external environment. So looking at the, the elements, again, the external environment is defined as um, opportunities and threats. So things that are outside of the control of the company. And the three elements that we will look at when we study the external environment is first the general environment, which influences the industries and the firms within it. That's the first element. The second element is the industry itself. And the third is very specifically the firms within the industry. So the competitive environment and the competitors within the industry. So when we look at external environment, these are the three elements that we typically look at. So before we dive into each of them, and I will give, will give you a couple of frameworks and, and tools um, for each of them for external environmental analysis, we have to talk first about the methodology of how companies actually track and analyze the external environment. And um, there are four methods that companies typically use and normally in that order, in that sequence. So first we start by scanning. Scanning you can imagine as um, just monitoring on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, the news that come up in the industry, basically um, the news that come up about the economy, 
about the industry and um, about competitors specifically. And the goal here of this scanning is to spot any early signals of potential changes, um, any, any trends that might come up. The nature of this data is very incomplete and unconnected. So basically what it means for me in my day-to-day -day job is to look at newspaper articles, newspaper clippings, social media, internet blogs, anything that can give any indication of upcoming trends. Once we have spotted something and have roughly an idea of what is happening, we start to monitor. So we pick out two or three themes that we identified through scanning and start to look at these in more detail. So we try to detect some meaning in those events and those um, sporadic news that come up that we spotted during the scanning process. We gather more specific data and um, might use customer surveys. We might purchase some, some data from databases and also um, employee surveys to understand what's really going on um, in the industry or in the market. Once we have a thorough understanding of a certain trend or a certain series of events, we try to do some forecasting. So we start to develop some models and give projections, ideally as reliable as possible, projections of what could happen in the future. That typically involves quantitative models, predictive studies, for example, forecasts of new technology trends, um, competitor behavior, and so on. And uh, once we have a good forecast, then we go one step deeper and try to assess for this specific forecast what might be the timing and the magnitude, the order of, of impact that we could expect from this. Now, the nature of, of this data is more informed guesses, uh, to be frank. Uh, there's a certain level of quantitative analysis, but um, a lot here has to do with scenario, scenario, scenario analysis, um, because here it's very hypothetical and often quite difficult to get reliable data. So scanning, monitoring, forecasting, and assessing are the four methods that we typically use to assess the external environment. So now I would like to jump in to the first element of the external environment, which is the general environment, and give you a framework that I like to use when assessing the external environment, the general environment. And this framework that I like to use is called DSTEP, D-E-S-T-E-P. It consists of six elements that we typically look at when we start the, the analysis of the general environment. The first one is demographics. So we are looking at trends of population size, trends of age structure, geographic distribution, the ethnic mix of people and income distribution, um, and, and a couple of other indicators that we study on an annual basis. Um, just to pick out one, age structure, for example, is fundamentally important. If you have an aging society, that has certain consequences on um, the, the type of food, for example, that people consume, the type of services that you have to provide um, for that aging population. And uh, we look there at long-term trends, five to 10-year trends um, of what is going on in the demographics. The second element, E, is economy. Uh, quite straightforward here, we look at the GDP growth, we look at inflation, interest, exchange rates, things that impact our financial performance um, in, in some way and that gives us, give us an idea of um, what is happening in the larger economy. The third element is the social cultural segment. Here it gets a little bit more um, sophisticated and a little bit more qualitative. We look at um, things like religious values, language communication, education um, trends, um, the values and the value system of a country itself, and also customs and traditions. So that's the social cultural segment, D, E and S, the first three steps in the D step model. Then next we look at technology. And that starts very broadly with technology, but goes then very specific into the technology that is coming up in the industry. 
So we look at the technology penetration rates of certain technologies that affect our industry. We look at investment in R&D, what our competitors doing, what are other companies doing in the marketplace, any innovations that come up, and um, more specifically also communication technologies, always also with the aspect of looking at new marketing um, methods or new marketing channels. Element number five is the environment, the physical environment. So here we look at um, things that are important to us, like energy consumption, energy rates, uh, renewable energy that might come up in, in countries, natural disasters that might threaten our business, um, water supply, which is um, in the food industry where I come from, very important. So things like that and what the impact might be on our business going forward in the future. And finally, the political and legal segment. So we're looking at uh, global and local political events, any changes in tax or regulations, labor laws, educational policies, any state enterprise policies that might affect us. Um, all of these always with the aspect of what are those events that are happening and how do they impact us as a company and um, our industry. Now, one note here, I introduced the D-step model. And some of you might be familiar with another model, which is called PESTEL. And I would like to, just on a side note, explain why I use the D-step versus the PESTEL model. So PESTEL um, looks at political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal factors. So you see quite a significant um, overlap or similarity here with the D-step model. Um, what PESTEL does, it splits up political and legal factors, which in the D-step model are combined in one area. Um, but it has two major shortcomings compared to D-step, and which is the reason why I prefer the D-step model over the PESTEL model. The first of these um, shortcomings is that PESTEL does not mention demographics specifically. And in my view, this is one of a, the core inputs into a good strategy to understand the demographics and demographic trends, customer trends, especially um, if you work in the consumer facing sector. And uh, second, PESTEL starts with a political factor. And um, when I do the strategy for my company, I don't normally start my environmental analysis with politics. I usually start with the customer base, so demographics first. And uh, therefore, the order of D-step seems to be more practical for me. Uh, so that is the reason for that. So after having looked at the general environment, now we go one level deeper and look at the industry environment. And the most well-known and very powerful model for understanding the industry environment is Michael Porter's five forces model. And the model looks like this. So we start off first by understanding the competitive rivalry in the industry. In the very first step, we need to identify actually what is the market that we look at? What is the industry that we look at? We need to identify the boundaries of that industry, whether we define it very narrow or whether we define it broad. And then we look at who are the competitors is that competitive rivalry very high or is it low in that case, um, few competitors. Then we look at the bargaining power of suppliers. So how strong are our suppliers? Again, the rating is here from high um, to low. The bargaining power of customers on the other side. So how strong are our customers when they negotiate with us and how much can they determine or drive the price? Then the threat of new entrants. So how likely is it that new players will come into the market? And the threat of substitute products. Now, not to confuse this with the industry itself, substitute products um, are alternative products that people could go to if they don't want to use the products that we produce. An example is a car and a motorcycle. So if we define the car industry as, as the industry that we look at, motorcycles, would be a substitute. So would be public transport, for example. You can buy the car or you can 
um, choose to use public transport instead and not own a car. Now, these are the, the traditional five forces. In recent years, there is a sixth force that has been added to it, and that is complementers. So these are companies that are supportive of our industry, um, that, that help our industry thrive. So the sixth force here. So going quickly through the five forces and explaining each of them. First, the competitive rivalry in the industry. We would look at the number of competitors. We would look at growth of the industry. Um, what is the cost structure of the industry? Fixed costs, um, variable cost. Any factors of differentiation, anything that sets apart one company from the other. And um, any strategic stakes that different companies have in the industry. And of course, also exit barriers. So how difficult is it? Uh, how easy is it to exit this industry? Then looking at suppliers, again, um, we would look at the number of suppliers, any substitute products that would be supplied to us. Um, how important are we as a company, um, as a customer to those suppliers? So what is our power versus, um, versus their, or what is our importance for their business? Um, how critical are the goods for our business? So is the supplier very important or can I easily switch suppliers, including looking at the switching cost and um, looking at whether those suppliers might actually forward integrate and become a competitor. Uh, basically uh, go into our field and compete against us head to head. And uh, similar for the bargaining power of customers, we would look at um, the significance of the customer. So how much of our total industry output is purchased by one customer, how, do, how much of our um, output is purchased by one customer. Um, switching cost of the customer to other companies, uh, then differentiation, standardization of products. And um, is there any threat of backward integration, meaning that one of our customers actually um, backward integrates, meaning he becomes a competitor in our industry and competes directly with us. So these are the three first forces that we look at. Then looking at threat of new entrants. So here we would look at barriers to entry, things like economies of scale, uh, any capital requirements, switching costs that are there, um, any government policies that exist, um, as well as expected retaliation. So what happens if a new entrant comes into the industry? How would the incumbents react and retaliate and uh, fight that new entrant? And finally, we would look at the threat of substitute products. Again, like switching costs, how attractive is the substitute product? Is it becoming more attractive than it was before? And how unique is our current product versus the potential substitutes? That begs the question, is there any factor of these five more important than others? And Greenwald and Kahn in their book, um, Competition Demystified from 2005, give an answer, answer to this that is quite, quite clear. Uh, what they are saying is that the factor that we really have to look at is barriers to entry. That is the most important factor. And they go as far as saying that we can ignore all the other factors and just look at barriers to entry as, as the most important part. Because if there are barriers to entry, then it's very difficult for new firms to enter. And that also means that we are protected as an incumbent, we are protected. Yeah. And they say this is actually the fundamental element of a competitive advantage to being able to do something what rivals cannot. So if rivals cannot enter our industry, that means that we have somehow a competitive advantage Therefore, this barriers to entry is out of the five forces, the most important force. So after having studied the external environment in terms of general environment, as well as the industry environment, now we go to the last element, which is the competitive environment. And um, I would like to give you a framework of thinking about 
analyzing the competitor. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, what are actually the objectives of the competitor versus ours? So what are our goals and what are the competitor's goals? How much is the competitor future oriented and how much risk is he likely to take versus are we likely to take? So the future objectives, that's the first step. Um, it goes a little bit into psychology here. So we, we try to understand um, what the competitor's plan might be. Then we go into the strategy. So first our strategy, our current strategy, how are we currently competing? And um, if there are any changes in the competitive structure, does our strategy support those changes? Like, are we prepared for those changes? Third, we have to make some assumptions. So we have to make assumptions about volatility. How volatile is the future going to be? Are we assuming that things will more or less stay the same in the status quo? Or are there major changes, major forces in the industry that drive change? And um, against those assumptions that we are making, what assumptions are our competitor likely making? Finally, we have to try to get an understanding of the capabilities of our competitors. So what are, what are our strengths and weaknesses? And how do we rate compared to our competitors? A little bit more about strengths and weaknesses will come in the next session. So once we have analyze those four elements, then we can look into what the response to those is. So what will our competitors do in the future? Where do we hold an advantage? Where does the competitor hold an advantage? And how will any action that we take and the response that we get will change the relationship between us and our competitors? So that is the first step and the framework of trying to understand competitors. Now going one level more specific, there's a, an interesting tool that I like to use occasionally, which is the strategy canvas. The strategy canvas has three elements. First, we have to identify the critical success factors and you see them listed on the left side of the chart. So here we talk about cost after sales service, delivery reliability, technical quality, testing services, um, design advice. All of these are success factors, um, for example, in an electrical components business. Um, the second is the perceived performance. And we see here value curves of the perceived performance. So how do customers perceive the performance of the different companies. So if you follow company A, for example, company A is very strong in cost and also quite strong in delivery reliability, still strong in after sales service and technical quality, um, not so strong in testing services. Uh, company B is basically trailing company A on all of these factors and company C is quite a bit behind. Now where it becomes interesting here is in element number five and number six, the testing services and the design advice, because that is something that company A and company B, which seem to be the market leader in the industry, are not really strong at, and in the design advice, not even really present. And this is what we call a blue ocean. So once company C has identified this blue ocean, they can go full into this area and dominate this area. And even though they are third and a laggard in the industry, so quite behind the other companies. Um, they can still beat the others by offering these services. And if they have the right approach to it and make these two services relevant to customers, they might even win in this industry. A great example of a company that has identified this and has changed their business model is actually Dell. Dell was the first computer company that changed to a direct marketing model. So directly selling to the customer and allowing the customer to customize their laptop or, or PC. And that was very revolutionary. So even though um, they, they had formidable competitors, by focusing on this blue ocean element, 
they managed to become one of the market leaders in the personal computer segment. So this was a short introduction into external environmental analysis. As I mentioned, external environmental analysis always stands at the beginning of the strategic planning process. It is the first thing that we do uh, when we launch the process um, in, in our company. And it gives us a very good round view of what is going on in the industry. In the next step and in the next session, we will then look inwards and internally and look at the, our own performance and our own strength and weaknesses.